thanks for coming to this session. It's kind of a nice segue from Leslie's stuff to what we're going to do next. It's a dual presentation, uh, be the next 50 minutes, and it's about the implementation of, I want to say intelligent compaction, but it's really intelligent paving. And uh, Melissa Corby with Interstate Engineering, uh, Interstate was doing the project management for the DOT, of course, Kurtz with the Grand Forks District, and they really formed a, a good team. They spent a lot of work uh, analyzing the data, put it in position. You know, I kind of consider them almost the experts of IC in our part of the world here. So let me do the introductions. Melissa's going to go first. Uh, Melissa grew up and currently lives in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Her father has a bridge construction company, which might be lucrative over the next five years with all the bridge work <laughs> going on. Uh, so she began working in the industry at a young age and continued working for him until she finished college. Melissa graduated from the North Dakota SCS in 2001 and then moved to Brainerd and worked for Gold Bears and then worked for the Minnesota DOT in design surveys and construction. 2013, she took a job with Interstate Engineering and moved back to Fergus Falls. She works primarily in North Dakota and her focus is on federally funded road construction projects. And then Kurt, uh, Kurt graduated from the University of North Dakota in 1995 with a BS in civil engineering. Began his career at the DOT as a transportation engineer in the materials and research division. He was employed as a material in research MNR from 95 to 99, and 99 transferred to, to Grand Forks District where he's been the district materials coordinator. So. Hopefully this is, I think it's a really good presentation. I've worked with them, get some takeaways from this. Kind of leads into that sustainability uh, topic we talked about earlier. So first, Melissa. Good morning, thanks Kurt, or not Kurt, uh, Ken. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, this project was a, a fun one to be a part of. And, you know, if you pick up the plan set, it looks like just a normal mill and fill. And it was actually quite complex for several reasons. Um, Kurt and I are going to talk about them, but our focus is going to be on three things. It'll be on uh, project management, materials and research, and the advanced technologies that we use. And not only were they, some of them specced into the plans, but also um, the technology was being tested for initial research. So this project was Highway 32. Um, you can kind of see a little blue box there, but it was roughly 45 minutes, depending on what end of, uh, southwest of Grand Forks. Um, it went through three counties. It was in Nelson County, Griggs County, and Steele County. Uh, the red arrows are Finley, North Dakota, and Grand Forks. And this project you'll hear us refer to as the Finley Project or the Aneta Project. And uh, it, they were tied projects. So the Finley Project is the main one we'll talk about. But it began at the intersection of 232, went 17.8 miles, um, the blue, uh, to the intersection of 45 and 32. And from there, the Aneta Project took over, and that went 10 miles north. The owner on this project was the North Dakota DOT and out of the Grand Forks District. The consultant was Interstate Engineering and the prime contractor was Knife River Materials out of Bemidji. Uh, as I mentioned, so total it was 27.8 miles. Uh, it was a one and a half and a two inch mill with a two inch overlay. Uh, there was a lot of patching on this, which really affected a lot of things. Some required subgrade repairs, some didn't. ADA improvements on both the projects, utility adjustments, relayed uh, milled materials on the shoulders, uh, striping and rumble strips. So this is just kind of a, I don't know how well you can see it, but a, uh, plan, uh, the scope of project out of the plans. This is the Finley project. Uh, this is the Aneta project. I'll go through these kind of fast. So pre-construction, um, a big part of this project that was really important um, happened before the project even started, being that there was so many um, different people and agencies involved in this one to get everybody involved 
right away and get the communication out there and get everybody working together. So the project was bid on May 14th of last year, and the pre-construction meeting happened not too long after that, and that was on June 4th. Um, again, like I mentioned, it was very important to invite everybody due to all the SPs on this job. Uh, these pictures weren't from this project, but it seemed fitting to try and prevent issues from lining up, um, coordinate early. So immediately, um, the, the prime contractor already had the construction signs, or had the sub set up the construction signs before we even had the pre-construction meeting, so they were ready to go. Um, so as soon as we had that meeting, the surveyors were out there and um, they set control for the IC and PMTP work and created the alignment. Um, and another important thing was uh, this, this project had Finley and Annette days, and so we invited the municipal staff to the pre-construction meeting. Again, just open up that line of communication, make sure there's no hiccups. So by the time it came to actually start the project, they didn't have their paperwork in and here we sat. And so then they got their paperwork in real fast. So again, communication, looking ahead. Um, I don't like last minute problems, but you know, I think if you look ahead and you plan, you can prevent a lot of things. The material came out of the Fordville pit and I've always liked this picture. This is a house they dug around in that pit. I don't know the story behind it, but um, it was a 43 mile haul to the north end of the project. 70 mile haul to the south end of the project so we were lucky that it happened in June and we had good temperatures and that means there's a 27 mile difference from end to end of the project uh, roughly depending on the day but they had about 40 to 45 trucks hauling between the paving and the milling milling they milled on the Finley project June 8th to June 18th uh, the Annetta project they milled June 21st to June 23rd the first 15,000 cubic yards of millings went to the DOT and were stored at the Finley truck station and then the rest were back hauled up to the Fordville pit to be used in the mix. Uh, they paved from June 11th to June 23rd on the Finley project. They paved from June 24th to June 30th on the Annetta project. And just something about Knife River is they always pave away from the plant. So they started milling and paving at the north end of the Finley project and they paved south. Once they finished that one, then they went to the north end of the Annetta project and then they paved south. Patching, I know this is a little bit hard to see, but um, the plans call, it, depending on which plan, but roughly about a seven and a half inch um, patch and depending on if it needed subgrade repair or not. And when we got out there, we found, again, depending on the patch, but it was roughly 10 inches deep after the two inch mill went over it. So they were quite a bit deeper than what we were expecting. Um, we, we had the mill go full depth to expose the grade um, and see what was under there. And these patches were roughly 100 feet long by, they were about full width of the road wide. Some required um, subgrade repair, some didn't. To, set, to test a subgrade, um, we did the roll test, we did some probing, uh, visual inspection, and we invited Andy Iash from Materials and Research to come down, and he tried out the lightweight deflectometer. There were six locations for patching in Finley, nine in Annetta. So this ended up being kind of an issue because they had to put three lifts of three inches in these patch areas plus the two inch overlay. So that took additional time for those lifts to cool, um, setting them back a little bit. Um, and it just took more planning on their part. Uh, also, you know, we always try to get that, that vertical cut and we weren't able to do that being the depth. And so we had to have ramps so the equipment could get in and out and we could, um, uh, compact up against the edges so we had to build those 25 foot ramps and we really made sure that those got tacked well. So part of this that I am really excited to have been a part of was just all the different innovations that they used. Oops, a couple came up. This had two different binders with test sections that Kurt will talk about. It had intelligent compaction. 
It had the paper mounted thermal profiler. It had the rolling density meter. Um, it had the ride spec, or SP, and it had density cores on, and density cores aren't unusual, but it did have it on the patches on these projects. And the lightweight deflectometer. So I'll, I'll let Kurt talk here about some of these. Good morning and welcome, and thanks for the opportunity to, to visit with you about the project today. So <clears throat> I think um, before I get into the, the, uh, the, the technologies that we used on the project, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the binder sections themselves. And so <clears throat> typically on, on these uh, mill and overlay projects, we always have, uh, you know, we always specify maybe one binder. and uh, basically, over the years, we've exclusively, you know, specified a, like a PG58S28 binder. And for those of you who are not really familiar with the, uh, the nomenclature, it's really it's performance graded for one thing, and and, and the the 58 and the 28 mean that the material should reasonably perform well for us uh, between the temperatures of 58 degrees Celsius and minus 28 degrees Celsius. And then the fact that it's uh, unmodified means there's, there's no additions. <clears throat> and so we thought it'd be the right time uh, on this project uh, to kind of break the, the normal and, and, and maybe try another binder on here that we could uh, you know, compare to the, to the usual binder we use. So we ended up uh, specifying another one by the name of uh, 58H34, which is polymer modified. And the thing about polymers, there's a lot of advantages, but I think the two most important ones is that it'll actually widen out that temperature range that you can get good performance on both ends, the running and the, and the, uh, and the cracking. And, and another thing is it makes the, the material or the binder more resilient. You know, it's kind of like a rubber band. I mean, you want, you want it to, to bounce back to where it was, and that's what we'd like to see out of our pavements too, so. And so, uh, and why are we doing all this? Well, the, like most ro roadways in, in North Dakota, the, the, the major, one of the major distresses is, is, is thermal cracking. And that, you know, thermal cracking is not a load. Uh, it's not caused by loads, it's really caused by our climate. Uh, the fact that it's getting 30, 40 below zero, um, you know, the pavements contract and they really take a lot of stress and, and they just about literally want to you know, pull themselves apart. And in some cases they do. And, and a crack forms just like the one here. And so now, now you got two situations where the crack that you have there now, as, a, as the tire's going over it, it's, it's going to flex more in that area. That's a kind of a weak area. And then also it's kind of a gateway now for, for the elements, you know, like moisture. And moisture's a, an enemy really of our pavements. So, so if you get them both in there at the same time and you get you know, like in the late fall and early spring and things, and, and, the, and the traffic is going over it, you're creating a lot of uh, forces in that pavement that will actually uh, start to wear it away. And over year, over time, it'll start to pump out that material, and it actually you have material loss in those areas, and that's what you see over to the left there, is that settlement. And, and that actually ends up being a ride issue then uh, for us. And so I won't go through the whole history here of the, of the, uh, of the road, but uh, the last overlay prior to this one was 2007. And over to the right, there's some international roughness index uh, numbers that we normally, uh, that we do with the Pathways van. And some are a little over and under as, as years, as you can see in the years, but I think that probably has something to do with the cracks maybe being a little more open in some spots when the Pathways van you know, goes over it. But uh, as you can see, it's kind of an upward trend. So, and this is a lot, has a lot to do with programming these projects again, is, is the ride. So, um, so when I first started in the DOT, the thinking was back then that if, if you had a crack like this in your roadway and you wanted to overlay it, um, you didn't really, you pretty much was given that you were going to get that back. So why do you want to spend more money on more polymer? asphalt at the time so that was the thinking then but now the thinking has changed so that we are thinking more about you know we're, we're getting some research in there stating 
that, that these polymers can help us not just in rutting but in cracking too. So we thought it would be a, a good choice at this point to, to try a couple binders like this. And so that's what we're going to try to do is to see if this polymer modified asphalt is actually doing better for it, will do better for us. So this is how the project actually got built. Over to the right is the, uh, is the control binder. And over to the left is the, uh, the modified binder. And then within those sections, we set up a couple of 3,000 foot test sections so we can evaluate things. And so if you're going to do this correctly, you know, you, like every other research project, you want to you wanna eliminate as many variables as you can. We try to make everything, either the sa everything else either the same or similar. And so we, you know, tried to make sure that these particular things here were, were, uh, were at least similar, very similar in nature, so that when we go to evaluate it, the only variable we have is the binders. Uh, this is just a bird's eye view of the, of the sections to the north of Finley. And this is the roadway prior to the, to, the, uh, to the mill. We went out and actually GPSed all these sites. That's Riley from our Grand Forks office went out and did this one Friday afternoon. And, and so we came back then and we plotted all that from both test sections. And then when we do some further evaluations now, we can actually uh, you know, go in and plot or overlay what we have that, that comes through or if it, if it comes through. And then we did a lot of testing too on this, or I should say a lot of sampling uh, on both test sections. And, and we mostly sampled for, for performance testing. And, and basically all the, you know, all the performance test is trying to do is to attempt to recreate the stresses and strains that are, that are, that are a pavement is expected to go through on the road in a lab setting. So, you know, it, it tries to characterize it and tries to see how it's going to behave. And so there's quite a battery of these of these tests, and um, actually, uh, we're going to be evaluating the course and comparing it to these to these performance tests as we go. And so, we're going to be doing several of them. Materials and Research who has just acquired several performance testing equipment, and, and we're going to be some of the mix is going to be tested there, as well as uh, uh, UND is going to do some testing. Some of their testing is actually inputs for the, uh, for the ME, as to ME payment design. And also, uh, Leslie and her team from the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center uh, graciously offered to, to do some testing for us too on, on these two binders. And we also tested the, the, uh, the binder in the materials and research lab, and that all passed good. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit, talk about the uh, construction or the, more the, the technology. And basically, we're, we started looking at this about five years ago in the DOT and, you know, for research reasons. And we wanted to know a little more about the pavements that we're doing. And uh, we're finding out it's a really good uh, forensics tool. And, and so basically, what we really want out of it, though, is for the contractor to have a practical uh, aid out there to help them, you know, with their quality control. That's the real purpose of all this, so that we can get some you know, that's, that's going to in turn give us better densities and uniformity out there. And so, uh, and then, you know, there's some long-term goals there, you know, with all the technology we had out there, you know, maybe we can reduce or even eliminate acceptance corridor someday, you know, and everything is non-destructive, which is kind of interesting. So workmanship is, is a big thing out there. We can plan these jobs all the way from the, when it starts from the pit and, and all the way through to the, uh, to the plant, but, the la when it leaves the plant, we don't have a whole lot of control over it as an agency, really. And so that next hour and a half really determines what the pavement's going to be like, how, how it gets put down and, and everything. So, so we want to, you know, here's another thing about coring. It's, it's not really a real-time benefit for the contractor. They don't really know what's going to happen until the next afternoon. So you really got a day and a half of paving there that, you know, you find out later that, well, some of the density maybe didn't make it, some of the cores, so. Um, so compaction, once again, I just want to reiterate that. That's what we're really doing this for, is compaction. And, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, uniform, a lot of uh, good benefits to, to compaction out there. It's going to keep us from having to maintain the roads, or not having to maintain them sooner than their, their design life. Um, 
Okay, so some of the technologies we used was intelligent compaction, which is basically just a roller-based technology, and it, uh, it's equipped with GPS, so basically every square foot of pavement out there has got some sort of history on it. You know, how many times the paper went over it, how, how many, how what was the temperature every time, uh, so, and what, what roller went over it. So there's all kinds of things you can get out of it. And then the, we have a paver mounted thermal profile, which is basically just a camera, infrared camera mounted on the, on the paver. Whoops, let me back up that one. And just want to show you that video real quick here. It's basically what it does all day long on the paver. It just goes back and forth and, and, and measures temperature. And it's a good indicator of the segregation or anything that's out there. Also, the, that's just a schematic of it there. Rolling density meter or the dielectric profile system uh, is Amy and, and John from Materials Research were out there, and, and Aaron, and, and we, uh, we, they collected about four or five days of data, which was really neat. This really made this project uh, put the icing on, almost having that out there, because you really could compare now with the other technologies. And uh, basically, that's ground penetrating radar, and it's non-destructive, and it's full coverage. That's what's the real thing about it. And so, also, um, Melissa mentioned that it, or Andy was out with the lightweight deflectometer, and, and that's a really interesting, I think that has a lot of future also with uh, measuring deflections and stiffness, and, and it's very practical and quick. So, this, we, we, there's so much data that comes from these technologies. In fact, you could actually stack it almost to the ceiling every day in paper. And, and so, but, but what do you do with it? I mean, you've got all this data, but what do you do? So, so they had to kind of bring, come up with a software that, uh, you know, that was a pool in front through MnDOT's, it's called Data, and that actually can filter out and reduce all that data and, and, and so you can display it and get some use out of it. And so that was, it's been quite interesting. So um, I got want to show you some of these things, just a few slides on what, you, what it can do. For instance, in this situation here, we, we've got the, the uh, roller technology and you can actually filter out what roller went down, what, what went down here in those like five or 600 feet. <clears throat> so the, the, the breakdown roller, which is usually the one after the first, uh, after the paver goes by and he makes these you know, roller counts. You can see where there's more in some places than others. Well, if you've been around the paver and stuff, you know, they'll do maybe two or 300 feet and then they'll move up and do another 200 feet. Well, there's gonna be some overlap in there and that's what those, more of those passes are that you see that's seven to nine passes. And then the intermediate does the same thing. So if you put them all together, that's what you get, you know. So there is a little invariability and in, in, in it passes out there. And the reason I'm showing you that is because you can see it up on the top there. And then at the bottom now, this is all the, the rolling density meter or D, DPS data that we have and in the same area. So, you know, if you look at it, there is some invariability in that too but now you can kind of line it up with the passes there. And it, it, you know, it appears to me like the, the, ones, the places with more passes actually have more density. So, um, okay, this is another, <clears throat> another photo, just a little bit busier photo there, but the top is the actual thermal profile that comes off that camera on the paper. And, uh, you can see some, there's some segregation in there. It might be like cyclic segregation that comes up maybe from the truck load. Uh, we've got some paver stops and Melissa is gonna go over a little bit more about what the domino effect of paver stops too. So <clears throat> you can see in that one, I just wanted to point out that one area there kind of by just to the left of the patch area. Uh, for some reason there wasn't any roller passes in there. I don't know if it's because of that patch or whatever it was, but you can see down at the bottom that the rolling density meter indicates that, that there wasn't much density at all. Here's another one where we have a paver, 14 minutes. You go straight down from there. The middle area there, the middle display is actually the, the temperatures when, you, when you're actually starting to roll the, ma the material. And, and so those, are, those temperatures are getting pretty cold already. Uh, these are surface temperatures. Yeah, it's a little more in, in the middle, but, but uh, actually the... Uh, you know, the cessation temperature of asphalt is pretty much around 180, so, you know, kind of starting with two strikes against you there. Uh, another, another time, another thing you kind of see 
on all jobs is railroad track areas. They, you know, by the time you get the paver, you know, lifted up and moved over, you lose lots of heat. It's kind of like interest, you know, it's, it goes while you're sleeping. I mean, it's the same, whatever you're doing, the material's getting colder. And, and so what you're seeing here is, you know, cold material when you go to start to roll it. And then just lastly here, we're going to talk about a handheld thermal imager that we had on. This wasn't on 32, but it was actually on some of our other jobs, uh, Highway 1 and, and a county job too. And you can see that over the right there, uh, I, Melissa has a handheld camera. That's her camera. And that's her dog, Ruby, there. That's, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, you can see the, the segregation in the, in the mat, you know, right behind the paver. And uh, here, here's a situation that we had. This was on Highway 1 two years ago. And we had a really cold day out there. It was like 40, 40 above and about 25 mile an hour. And so the paper stopped for 13 minutes and we took an information core at that spot. And it actually ended up, I'm surprised it got as good as it was. It was 88.7, you know. And it showed up in, on, DAP, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the software also. And this is, uh, there was a, person by the name of uh, Todd Mansell out there from Caterpillar, and he had a handheld camera there too, and he actually shot it, that that's image there, after the paper had started up, and that's the heated screen as it's sitting there for 13 minutes. You know, and the core is pretty much to the right of the screen. Here's another image. Uh, that particular camera he had, you could actually show the thermal <coughs> image and then the, a regular picture, so you can actually see the material segregation there. And if it's, if it's segregated materially, that'll detect that too because the temperature comes out of that material faster so you can actually see that. So this is just a, this is how it showed up in the software. Here's just a short video I want to run here. Let's see here. This is, this is in the paver, right in the auger system before it hits the screen. You can see that uh, area there in the middle, how it's kind of stagnant, it's cooler, and so that sometimes that affects, you know, as it's coming out of the screen, uh, as far as some of your material that you get on the roadway. And then the last one I had was uh, one that you see on the hoppers, how the material is actually, uh, you see the stuff on the, on the, uh, against the, the wall of the, of the hopper, how it uh, is stagnant there. So, you know, anytime they lift their wings, you're gonna get some of that coal material. So, but that's all I got, and I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. She's got some really interesting slides on their things, that, results of things here, so. So I remember hearing at the DAPA conference that we measure the quality by density and the public measures it by ride. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both. A um, little bit about the density on this project. The rolling pattern, they used a rubber tire for the breakdown, steel drum for the intermediate, and obviously steel drum for the finish. Out of that Fordville pit, they had 50,800 tons for mainline and about 4,100 tons for patching. And they ended up with about $109,000 in incentive paid for densities. Uh, average densities on this project, mainline was 93.4% and longitudinal was 92%. So we got really good densities. Um, just a couple lessons learned. Um, one day we, we had a rain event. Everybody knows, watch for rain, but this one, um, we ended up wasting 343 tons, and the contractor gave the state a really nice subgrade repair. Uh, it, you know, if there's problem areas, you know, they probably patched on it for a while, so you're gonna have a little thicker mix. Um, know your contract language and let that make your life easier. And this one, um, they were tied projects, and one the, in the patching, the oil was incidental, and the other, it was paid separate. And so that made things um, a little more hectic as far as paying for incentive on the patches. So just check your bid items. Um, a little bit about the ride. So again, the Finley project was 17 miles and the Anetta project was nine. 
So on the Finley project, they had a $10,400 deduct. They had 10 muskrind lots. They had 258 locations that registered on the 16-foot rolling straight edge. The Aneta project, they had a $22,750 incentive. They had four muskrind lots and 130 locations that registered on the 16-foot rolling straight edge. So bid total was $4.5 million. When all was said and done with all the incentives, the project ended up being $4.8 million. Uh, as I mentioned, the compaction incentive was 109,000. And just kind of something interesting, I think, that uh, the PG58S28 and the mix uh, was 61.25 a wet ton bid price and the PG 58H34 and the mix was 65.28 a wet ton. So that ended up being $4 a wet ton more for the better oil on this project or the polymer modified. Um, and this project, the intelligent compaction bid price was 5,000 and the thermal profiling bid price was 5,000. So we got really good prices on those. So a little bit about paver stops. Um, and this was quite eye-opening. We grabbed these numbers off the thermal profiler and the Finley project, they paved for nine days. The total time the paver was running was 88 hours. The total time the paver was stopped was 33.5 hours. The total time the paver was running of that was 54.5 hours. So for lack of better terms, the percentage of time that that paver was productive on the Finley project was 62%. Um, and the total percentage of time that the paver was in paver stops was 38%. So that was a total of 2,012 minutes or 1.4 days that that paver was in paver stops. Um, so that was pretty eye-opening to us. And thermal profiler, just so you know, it counts anything a minute or longer for a paver stop. So the Aneta project, they paved for five days, uh, 42.8 hours the paver was running. 17.1 uh, hours it was in paver stops and the total time the paver was moving was 25.7. Um, percentage the time the paver was productive was 60% and the percentage of time the paver was in paver stops was 40%. So this equates out to be 1,025 minutes or 0.7 days that it was in paver stops on that project. So this, as Kurt mentioned, um, on the left here, this is the thermal imager that our company bought. And it gives you just a little better visual of the paver stops. This is just the same paver stop. Um, and so as we started digging into this technology and looking at things that you know, were cause and effect and correlated together, Paver stops were a huge thing that affected these IRI and MRI numbers. So every time you see a spike in your MRI numbers, it doesn't mean there's a paver stop, but every time there's a paver stop, you see a spike in those numbers. Uh, workmanship on patches, joints, um, taking mix from mainline to pave the county road. So just at the bottom of that picture, I should say county road approach, but um, just slowing that paver down, you know, as they're taking trucks off the main line. Um, and paving the county road, you're slowing it down or you're causing it to stop more often. Um, same thing, taking mix from mainline to pave patches. Uh, strong winds, cooling temperatures faster. Uh, we noticed a correlation for winging out for those field approaches. Um, truck stopping to backhaul mix. Again, um, it just slows the process down. By the time they go up there, you know, load up with millings, drive back to the plant, dump them. And segregated mix, again, we saw direct correlation. And low compaction temperatures made for a rougher ride. And the other one, um, the roller sitting on the hot mat. So Tyler helped us put some of these um, technologies all together into Excel, and we came up with some different graphs. This is one day. This was on 616, and it just had kind of everything um, involved. So your orange is your MRI numbers, your purple is your patches, we did three patches that day, your black at the bottom is your paver stops, so you can kind of see, you know, how they, they all 
correlate where there's black, there's a spikes in the MRI numbers. Might take, there's a lot of data on these, so. So this is the entire northbound lane of, that, of the Finley Road. The blue arrows are your patch areas. Your green is your MRI numbers. Your yellow, it's kind of hard to see, but your yellow is your paver stops. And then along the bottom, those little lines, those are the bumps that came up on that 16-foot rolling straight edge. So now we localize it a little bit on these Slides you're going to see the orange, that again is your MRI numbers. Um, we added the bumps and dips or the rolling straight edge on here. And you got your paver stops are in the green. So you can see there's a nine minute paver stop, the MRI number, the patch, you got some bip, dips, some bumps. Um, again, I can't see what that says, 20 minute paver stop the spike in numbers, eight minute um, spike in numbers. So, you know, a really easy way to increase your ride incentives is to, to slow your paver down, you know, instead of start, stop, start, stop, um, and try and reduce your paver stops. Um, this one again, just another slide showing the paver stop and the MRI number. Another one, 48 minute spike, um, 10 minute spike. I don't know if you can see these, but it looks like it's around a 350 um, MRI number. Um, this was at the very south end of the project. So the last day they were paving on the Finley project and they had a lot going on because that was a 200 intersection. And so you can see some bumps, some dips. They had a 133 minute paver stop um, and the number spike. The next one um, has I don't know how well you can see it, but a photo of um, the temperatures in there, which again played into that. Uh, this is by the Sharon Railroad tracks, and this was um, probably our worst piece. If you look, there's about a 1600 MRI number there. Some dips, some bumps, paver stops. You're never going to not be able to pave at railroad tracks, but with some foresight, if you can try to plan things out and just eliminate um, as many of these issues as you can. Um, this one here is that same location, but it has uh, the temperatures in there. So the thermal profiler, which is the one off of the paver that's taking the temperature. So when they just put the mat down, it got laid down at 200 to 225. And then when the first roller hit it, um, it looks like it was 140 to 150 degrees. So, you know, that's part of, that, that area just had a lot of things going against it. Um, again, you got your dips, your bumps, your paver stops, your MRI, everything, you know, it's kind of same theme. Um, here's an example of where one of the rollers was sitting, you know, and, and your numbers spiked 12 feet, 12 feet. Um, this, as Dustin talked yesterday, the MRI lots are 528 feet, a tenth of a mile. So this is an example of one lot. And you can again see the correlations and the picture up there shows um, your temperature also playing into this. And, um, you know, the paver speeds, when it varies, those can affect your numbers. Uh, this one here, same, same type of photo, another lot, um, your your roller sat for 14 minutes, caused a bump. Here, uh, they had a paver stop for 57 minutes, caused a spike. You can see the paver varied in speed. Um, and then the 140 to 170 temp. So these are, these are all things that we knew, but this technology is just kind of reinforcing and proving it. Um, 
this one here, same, same thing, speed of paver, um, the roller sat, and where it sat, it was about 220 to 230, and it created that spike. Um, again, the dips and the bumps, so. Uh, as far as these are the, the good things that we're seeing come out of this technology, um, and one of the pieces that I've really enjoyed um, about this project is just all the different entities that were involved and working with all the different people. So my boss says that engineering is about building communities and I thought that this would kind of sum up this well. Um, this was out on the project and this was one of the Knife River workers. thought this was cute. So, oops. Um, that's about all I got. I welcome you guys to call Kurt or I with any questions that you have or anything. So. By the way, Kurt and Melissa will be do doing digging into some of these slides with a little more detail at the asphalt conference here this week. But really great job of putting it together it's stuff we all know uh, but when you can put the data to it you know you, you get what you measure in in any part of life so the, when when melissa threw that in there about uh, one team one goal carrying that kid across i said the problem with doing that is now you got 30 kids that line up waiting to get a ride across the pavement so we're, we're out of time uh, for now. If you could give them a good round of applause and a break. <laughs>